Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, everyone. We're back. Black is back. <laughs> Black is back. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and continue in our last um, 35, 40 minutes of the plenary, and then we can adjourn. Right now, we're going to go ahead and continue with Section 4 of the plenary report, led by Chairman O'Malley S. Chitella. And uh, I'll let you continue. Do you want to wait a little bit? Uhuru. Uhuru. Okay. Uhuru. In September 1981, at our first Congress, our party passed an historic resolution calling for the founding of the African Socialist International that would assume the responsibility for, one, liberating and uniting all of Africa under a single all-African socialist state, two, uniting, coordinating, and giving general assistance and direction for the revolutionary struggles of all African people wherever they occur and whenever the aims of such struggles are consistent with the aims of the International Socialist Association. Three, achieving the objective consolidation of African nationality for all African people wherever we are oppressed and exploited throughout the world due to the machinations of imperialism." Unquote. The first meeting to build the ASI occurred in Brooklyn, New York. The following year, 1982, immediately after the World Tribunal on Reparations for African People and the founding of ANRO in its wake. From that time onward, much of the energy of the party was directed at the mission of building the ASI. It became our strategic mission to win the, rec the recognition that whatever we did in the U.S. against our oppression, we would never win our liberation until we created the African Socialist International that organically connected the struggle of Africans in the U.S. with those of Africans worldwide, and especially in Africa, our national homeland. From the first Congress in 1981, the strategic direction of our party revolved around building the ASI. A considerable portion of all our resources went to this project. Much of this work occurred within the U.S., especially with attempts to win ZANU and the PAC through their expatriate militant organizers, and in the case of the PAC through occasional meetings with its primary leaders. We also worked to establish a relationship with Grenada under the leadership of the New Jewel Movement and sent an organizer to meet with Thomas, Thomas Sankara, leader of Burkina Faso before his assassination. It was our hope to win unity with the ASI project and launch a founding ASI Congress in either Grenada or Burkina Faso. The fate of both these revolutionary projects was further proof of the urgency of our task to build the African Socialist International. Our ASI work quickly extended, in Grenada, I was thinking, you know, like when the U.S. invaded that country and got all its documents and papers, they would have found there uh, communications that we had initiated with the New Jewel Movement to build the ASI. And, you know, I think about Tomas Sankara, who uh, was an incredible force. You, you don't know much about Sankara, but you should Google Sankara and see this man and listen to this man. And, and uh, just an incredible force. And, you know, um, these were people we were trying to pull into this process. Our ESI uh, work quickly extended to regular organizing trips to Europe, especially London, where many Africans from throughout European colonies were living or through which they were in transit for any number of reasons. A general resistance from many organized Africans to revolutionary organization and ideology complicated our initial work in London. This was especially true of Africans who were not born on the continent of Africa and prefer to identify themselves as so-called black with a strategic mission 
to create what they characterize as so-called black and Asian unity. Although some of them consider themselves Pan-Africanists, they saw their function as solidarity with the people and struggle on the African continent, not as an integral part of the same struggle or the same nation. Nevertheless, after many years of work, we were able to organize a base in London through Comrade Luizi Kinshasa, a member of an organization we had been attempting to unite with the ASI for years prior to Kinshasa's arrival in London. Comrade Luizi's entry into the party allowed us to change the general strategy for building the ASI. Instead of an effort to locate and win existing groups to the ASI, our strategy now shifted to building the party in England and wherever else possible as the primary method of organizing ASI component organizations. With the consistent work that has been done over the years in England and Europe and with major ASI conferences being regularly conducted in London, the ASI was also able to extend its reach to South, West, and East Africa. The London ASI conference attracted forces from West Africa allowing us to establish a base in that region and from South Africa where we re-established contact with the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania that eventually proved unfruitful. We have also reached into South Africa and the Bahamas, South America rather, and the Bahamas, and are now a growing factor in defining and leading the struggle of our liberation throughout the world. On September 12, 2009, the party played a major role in pulling together the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. This is a diverse group of anti-imperialist Africans that, oppose, that opposes U.S. imperialism throughout the world and within the U.S. itself. Mostly advocates of African self-determination, the group is comprised of individuals that are motivated by different ideological and political beliefs, but were disturbed by and opposed to the ongoing wars in the Persian Gulf and the wars that were not being addressed by the traditional white anti-war or peace movement. This contradiction was spoken to in the proposal I presented to the coalition to organize the successful groundbreaking national conference against the other wars that occurred on March 26, 2011 in Washington, D.C. And quote, the coalition interests and this political intervention in the peace movement is based, in part, on our unwillingness to allow the white left to monopolize the definition of what the struggle for peace is about. Our coalition is opposed to an imperialist peace, one that does not disturb the relations of power between the oppressed and the warmongering imperialist oppressor. It is this historical defect of the U.S. left that prevents it from giving genuine, practical, and material solidarity to the national liberation struggles of Africans and other peoples within the U.S. Indeed, the U.S. white left has been generally incapable of supporting any struggles anywhere that did not benefit the leftists organizationally and or politically, or, did not, or that did not revolve around issues that appear to present an immediate or future challenge to their material interests as U.S. North Americans. Thus, millions of Africans have been dying in the Congo, most recently since 1998, with little or no alarm by the white left. Similarly, the bloody U.S.-induced deadly mayhem in Somalia, Sudan, Ivory Coast, and other places in Africa receives no attention by the white left in the U.S., and Haiti is dealt with essentially because of the current crisis related to the earthquake and characterized primarily as responsive to so-called natural disasters. Nor are Africans the only ones who are marginalized by the U.S. white left agenda. The same is true of Mexicans suffering U.S. settler colonialism within the U.S. Immigration raids and special police concentrated in border areas that separate the Mexican people from each other and the occupied lands along with imposed poverty, a host of social contradictions, and massive incarceration are the norm for this oppressed people. The native people, or Indians, 
like the Mexicans and other indigenous people who suffer the consequences of settler colonialism. Even now, these survivors of a US policy of genocide as despicable as that of Hitler, the imperialist boogeyman used to deflect genuine criticism of imperialism, are living in horrible conditions in concentration camps euphemistically referred to as reservations." Uh, uh, unquote. Additionally, many of the founding members of the coalition were motivated by the fact that Obama's presidency was, for the first time ever, giving a black face to U.S. imperialism. Because of this, some felt a special responsibility to show African opposition to this African imperialist stooge, especially in the face of the overwhelming public support shown to Obama by the masses of Africans in the U.S. and throughout the world. Some felt we had to demonstrate permission to the world's peoples, oppressed and threatened by U.S. imperialism, but sympathetic to the struggle of Africans within the U.S. to fight back against the U.S. imperialism of Obama just as vigorously as against the imperialism of Bush and others. Since its founding, the Black is Back Coalition has helped to change the face and character of the anti-war movement within the U.S. and has, with help from our party, extended its organizational reach and influence to the Caribbean and Europe. On November 7, 2009, the coalition held the first national demonstration at the White House against the warmongering regime of Barack Hussein Obama and the only left-led, African-led demonstration against the U.S. government since Obama's installation as the public face of imperialism. In January of 2010, the coalition held the Consol Consolidation Conference that laid out its general direction and February launched a national mobilization in Miami in support of our people in Haiti following the devastating earthquake there. The mobilization with much participation from the expatriate Haitian community demanded reparations from the U.S. and France to Haiti for the centuries of ruthless exploitation and the return of John Bertrand Aristide, who with French participation had been forcibly de deposed as president and exiled by the U.S. As recently as August 2011, the coalition sponsored an international day of action against the wars on Africa and African people. This resulted in actions of varying, varying sizes and significance throughout Europe, the U.S., and in the Bahamas. In many ways, the coalition is one of the most important developments by our U.S.-based struggle for self-determination since the 1960s. It is a coalition that has won many people to political life, providing their first real involvement in the movement. Some of these people have even come into our party. The Black is Back Coalition has also challenged the sectarianism that has impacted our movement for decades since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. It has provided the ability of individuals and groups with ideological and political differences to overcome an inability to work together against U.S. imperialism in a common formation. Many of the people who participate in the coalition were genuine anti-imperialists before the creation of the coalition. However, generally speaking, they were working in isolation from each other and denied the advantage of collective genius and action. It was the party that was capable of pulling us all together, something that is further testimony of the significance of being in place with organization, experience, and enough political maturity to advance a genuine revolutionary national democratic program that speaks to the diverse revolutionary national democratic interests within our colonized community. We are a revolutionary party, and we have the responsibility to lead around every question. In the pamphlet, Build and Consolidate the Party, published in 1984, we were very clear about what it means to be a revolutionary African internationalist party. Quote, today the party has come to terms with the fact that not only must we not be apologetic for leading, it is our absolute responsibility to lead. The party must help the mass organizations, the community organizations, prison collectives, and campus groups 
to work out the correct political line and to properly direct their activities toward political independence, African liberation, and socialism. This is the party's task because all the party's work prepares it best for this responsibility. And because the party is the most perfected and highest form of black working class organization and the highest expression of the people's will to struggle. Within the ranks of the party are the most advanced, most conscious representatives of the colonized African population, the black working class and the toiling masses, the representatives upon whose shoulders rests the ultimate responsibility for raising up the revolutionary, scientifically guided consciousness of the black working class. It is clear that the liberation of our people and the emancipation of our class cannot be won by just any kind of organization. It is even clearer that many existing organizations have no interest, absolutely no interest, in making revolution, and that even some of the radical nationalist organizations are only willing to go just so far. However, the role of the political leader can only be fulfilled by the party as the highest form of organization for national liberation and the emancipation of the black working class. Political leadership is a science and an art. It is not something that one has automatically. It requires skill and the capacity to quickly choose and change forms of struggle. V. I. Lenin, the successful Russian revolutionary, correctly declared, we are the party of a class and therefore almost the entire class should act under the leadership of our party. However, with the victory of the struggle for democratic rights which came as a concession to the black petty bourgeoisie and at the expense of the black revolution of the 60s, the black petty bourgeoisie realized its fundamental political aim and lost any historically derived progressive character it once had. Thus, the mantle of leadership, both for the struggle for national liberation and socialism, has fallen upon the shoulders of the most despised and feared black working class. Therefore, as the advanced detachment of the black working class, the African People's Socialist Party assumes the leadership not only for almost the entire class, but also for almost the entire people. Therefore, we resist any, act, any efforts to reduce the activity of the party to that of a passive recorder of spontaneously developing events in the manner of so-called revolutionary organizations whose theory or program does not require intervention in the practical struggles of life. Our entire mission and the basis of our existence are to, are to become actively involved in life. Our task is to mold the consciousness of the working class and all the toiling masses and to permanently lead the revolutionary struggle of the masses for political independence, African liberation, and socialism." Unquote. Uhuru. So is there a discussion? We're encouraging comrades who are participating in this plenary over the internet to participate as well. Uh, you can raise issues, questions, uh, struggles, contradictions. I think the way you do that is um, through, uh, uh, what is it, DJ? At UhuraRadio.com. DJ at UhuraRadio.com. So, and those who are present may also uh, use this opportunity to raise any kinds of questions, struggles. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here, as you know, we're discussing things that many people are familiar with. Uh, we've talked about much of the history of the party in every opportunity we've had to come together. Uh, but part of what we're doing now is really trying to contextualize it and help to understand uh, this history, not as just a series of events that you know, we might have experienced, but whatever implications they may have had uh, for advancing the struggle and uh, why they were significant at a given, you know, historical juncture. So if there's anyone, yes, comrade. Uhuru. Uhuru. Start talking. 
Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting because when I was quoting Buchanan uh, just the other day, he talked about uh, tribalism being a problem in the white world, tribal wars, and he was talking as effectively about the wars that were existing between white people as tribal warfare. And uh, that's what I was saying, you know, even when you start using certain kind of terminology to define the African reality, even questions like race and stuff like that, they serve <laughs> to undermine the whole concept of ours being a people, a nation, uh, and tribes just have this real negative connotation that, you know, Africans have never called themselves any damn tribes. <laughs> and this is something that, you know, uh, Europe uh, created. Uh, and, you know, there have been different ethnics and still are different ethnic groups, but the reason that they continue to have such an impact on the life of African people uh, in part is because of the uh, kind of imperial intervention that has locked us into these artificial states that prevent uh, the consolidation uh, real clearly of uh, an, a national uh, African, Africa-wide economy. There is no national Africa-wide economy. And these borders where you have all Af Af most of the uh, economic activity within the continent of Africa occur within these artificially created borders. And what that means is that, uh, that uh, you know, it's economic life and economic activity, it's trade and things like that, that forges everything, including language. But, you know, you've got a lot of different languages on the continent of Africa. It's, it's true in part because there's no all African economy. So uh, uh, language itself is something that emerged in human society and history as a function of production. Uh, people had to learn how to talk uh, in order to get somebody to pass the hammer so they could do something over here, you know? I mean, uh, and when you have a situation where there's these artificial borders that restrict the ability of African, Africa to develop, a, you know, like an all-African nation, then it frustrates all kinds of other developments as well, language being one of them. Uh, uh, the political economy continues to revolve around small, uh, ethnic groups and things like that, most of the economic activity. You go to a place like Ghana or even uh, Sierra Leone, you will find that um, the, 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 the government uh, and the, uh, the economy, the, there's no national, there's no economy there that can feed the people. People have to create their own ability to survive. You see children out you know, uh, selling this and selling that, you have that kind of situation. So you don't have, and so, and who best engaged in that kind of economic life? It's families, it's clans, if you will. It's the so-called larger family group, that ethnic groups, that's where the political, the economic activity occurs. So the thing that breaks us out of that is imperialism off our backs. It's the destruction of these borders. It's to get, get if the U.S. would stop messing with our coal tan, uh, uh, if Europe uh, would stop uh, coming to get, you know, like our cobalt uh, and taking all our land and resources, then we would see, you know, uh, the disappearance, not necessarily the disappearance of ethnics. That may last for a long time. But the fact is that they will no longer be the defining relationship. Ethnicity will not be the defining relationship. Because everybody in every nation, you will find that people have a lot of identities. You know that, don't you? Uh, in the Americas, the European nation, you know, people are, uh, uh, in addition to being Europeans, uh, people are also Christians, they're Baptists, uh, they're Boy Scouts. Uh, they, are, they have a lot of different identities, but the primary identity is the European nation, the Europe. That's the thing that defines them. Africans have a lot of identities as well. You know, Northsiders, Southsiders, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Baptists, you know, uh, uh, you know, Muslims. You know, we come a whole bunch of ways. But the problem is that they take on greater emphasis because of the absence of a consolidated African economy and African African economy. You get that happen, you consolidate the African economy, we will for a long time, we will still be Muslims and Christians for a long time. We'll still have, uh, you know, be uh, Fulani and these other kinds of things, but they won't be the dominant thing. And guess what? After a while, they will disappear as significant at all. 
uh, because our activity that's necessary you know, for our ability to produce and reproduce each other will no longer be confined to such small uh, social you know, entities as tribes and clans, what people call tribes and clans and ethnicities, Uhuru. That's even true, I, I place in that context, but you know, even the so-called Haitian and the, you know, uh, a so-called Ghanaian or Nigerian, somebody said that you know, uh, Nigerian is not even African. That you know it, it you know and that it comes from nigger area, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, we just have all of these, <laughs> all these definitions that's imposed on us uh, by something separate from what our requirements are, you know, like as a people to move forward. Uhuru. Anyone else? Uhuru. Gangs? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's important. You know, uh, it's another kind of division our community used to love about Fred Hampton. You know, because Fred Hampton, you know, worked in Chicago where some of the biggest gangs, other than the police, in addition to the police department, you know, uh, were in motion. And, and Fred, you know, took the revolution to the so called gangs. You know, he took the red, black, and green. Y'all talking about the red and, you know, the red. You know, uh, colors and the, and the, what was the red and blue? Is those, was those the primary colors with the, you know, hell, the real, the real issue is red, black, and green. You know, I mean, and he took the, the revolutionary struggle. That's what we have to do. We have to go into our communities. We have to organize on the ground. We have to take the burning spear out there and help people to understand this reality. And guess what? Somebody said in this discussion, Sister Keisha, I've never had an opportunity to work with such a great group of people. That it's like family in a certain kinds of ways. That's what people in those gangs are looking for. They are looking for a better and different and better relationship than what they can find out there in the imperialist world. So they find it with each other. This time they can find it with each other on a mission to liberate ourselves and they can define the, re the, re the reality for them uh, in these communities that we are locked into. Uhuru. Uhuru, Africa. His brother claims he's from, from UK, but we know better. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you speak Lingala, don't you? Yeah. yeah, I thought so. Yeah, that's not <laughs> something that you find in the UK that often. Uh, but increasingly we do. But it's from people who from where? Congo. From Congo and Africa, yeah. Go ahead, comrade. Good. Five year gestation period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Um, 
Yes. Right. Right. Right on. Yes. 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 You know, um, I mean, I think those, everything you said is so important, and I'm, I, you're going to have to bring me back to the second uh, question that you just raised, because the first thing I want to say is that uh, there's something that's happening in the world. You know, this is what Brzezinski was talking about, like how communications has made it so that what used to take, you know, such a long time to happen now is happening overnight almost. Africans, you know, getting the message overnight. And... What's really incredible about this period, too, is that it doesn't require literacy, that much literacy. It doesn't require, you know, I mean, because people can see it. You know, they can go, to, you know, and see it on a cell phone. They can see it, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, through uh, their computers and things like that. And Africans are being radicalized and, and being brought to, back to Africans in a thousand different ways. Almost every other month in this country, for example, the U.S. government is arresting some young African who may be from Somalia or whose parents were from Somalia because they're seeing what the United States is doing in Somalia. And then they are trying to get back to Somalia, like to fight the U.S. in Somalia. And um, I think that what has to happen is like the comrades from Ivory Coast, who we worked with for many years, trying to make something happen, and now they're back in touch with us again in London, in England. They said they're interested in the ASI. But being interested in the ASI has to mean that they join the African People's Socialist Party UK, if they're in the UK. If they're in Belgium, they need to join the African People's Socialist Party Belgium. And the same thing is true with France. Because for them, they are trying to take the issue of the ASI and say, okay, we're interested, now let's solve the problem in Ivory Coast. We have to bring them into political life. Like if I show up in England, if an African Socialist International, if somebody is tied to the African Socialist International goes to the Bahamas, what you do is you go and knock on the door and say, I'm reporting to duty, right? Doesn't matter where you're from, I'm reporting to duty. And then it may very well be that your responsibility in the, the organization in the UK would be connected to taking African internationalism to uh, Ivory Coast. But whether it means that or not, what it definitely will mean is that you struggle in the United Kingdom against the conditions that Africans are confronted with right there. You're not some spectator when Africans in the United Kingdom are getting our butts kicked and just saying, that, give me something that we can use in Ivory Coast. You join the Revolutionary Project, and the ASI gives us an opportunity to fight on every front. Yes, we want the Ivory Coast, and that might be what you are assigned to do.
to deal with the Ivory Coast. But again, it will not be separate and apart from uniting with the party. That's why even we hear a lot about the ASI, for example, in Europe. I want to hear more about the African People's Socialist Party in Belgium. I want to hear more about the African People's Socialist Party in France, in Germany, in those other places where we are located. Yes, all of us are part of the ASI. But I think what it helps to really clarify who we are if we identify ourselves as the party in those locations. So you don't have to be, you know, what about Belgium? You got a lot of Africans in Belgium from Congo. But I also see Africans in Belgium uh, who come from Senegal and other kinds of places. They need to be in the African People's Socialist Party, Belgium. And, uh, and we take on the struggle against imperialism, you know, from that vantage point. In this country, when the, when the Communist Party USA was created, up until the 1930s, the majority of the members of the Communist Party USA were foreign born. They were not born in the United States. You have any idea why that might be the case? It's because the majority of the African, of the, of the people in the United, who were foreign born are coming from places where a crisis of imperialism of a certain sort represents itself more sharply, more clearly, and they were able to unite more easily with the revolution. That's the same thing true here. It's the same thing, you know, what we will find is that Africans from various parts of the world would join the revolution. I don't look for no American Negroes. You know, I look for African revolutionaries. Wherever the hell they may have been born or come from, that's what, that's what has to come to the party. So that's one thing that affects you know, how we approach and how we take that question on. The other thing is this. We're going to find Africans who identify with the Congo and identify because that's where they were born. That's how, you know, they were, they were uh, raised to understand the question. But I, I wasn't born there. I still have a responsibility to deal with what's happening to Africans in the Congo. At the moment, I am able to organize here and get Africans from wherever they are to join in solidarity with that struggle as a part and, and define it as a part of the attack on African people that we're fighting with. So we help the Africans who are from Congo to understand a greater relationship. Do you see, we can, we can give them a bigger vision of what it is they're involved with because I'm not from Congo. Why the hell am I involved in this? Why am I taking up this stance? Because I'm an African like you are an African. And I suffer consequences of being an African here just like, we suffer, like I'm suffering a consequence on the continent of Africa itself. I'm not clear, am I? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that that is what's going to help to clarify the question for all of us. Africans on the continent of Africa are going to have to start saying that I stand in solidarity, or we stand in solidarity with, with our, African brother, our African brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom, our African brothers and sisters in France, in Belgium, and in the United States, and in Haiti. We're going to have, that's, we have to cross-pollinate, you know, helping to take the level of consciousness to a different place. That's what, that's what leadership must mean. That's what being the advanced attachment of the African working class must mean. We take that science to people when they're in motion. That's what I love so much about what you comrades are doing right now in Europe, because all these Africans from Congo in serious motion now. It's, we don't, they don't need us to help them organize a demonstration, although we do that as well. What they need the revolution for is to take the science, to intervene and take the science up into the mass struggles that they're involved in. And that's what's been so wonderful, watching you comrades, you know, uh, involved in that struggle in London, taking the science of African internationalism up into the, to the, to the motion. And people can hear you much better. They hear you much clearer. Before this was happening, you go talk to people about African internationalism, they can't hear us or what. But now people are in motion, and they've been mobilized by events there, then they're open to being able to hear what you said they want, solutions. And we can take them solutions, we can take them to science. So I think that's really important. Other thing I want to say quickly, or oh, somebody's standing at the mic, so I'll stop talking. Go ahead, Sister Hobbin. So how do you respond to uh, people that say, okay. how do you respond to people that say, um, Ideology about reclaiming African 
with resources for African people, about the parasitic world economy, that it's too intellectual for the majority of black people to grasp. I heard you sort of covering that a little bit earlier, but I specifically want to ask that because I've, I've had several people who claim they understand Please. The, the real issue is this. The Africans do understand it. If they get access to this information, and they show their understanding of this in a thousand different ways. That's why the little white lump woman got her purse snatched at the, at the mall. That's why, that's why white people are scared of black people in the dark in every city, you know, uh, in every urban area in the country. Because Africans want to take back. They might not have understood you know, they don't understand the dynamics and all the theory and politics that we're talking about, uh, but it's skin, it's right below the surface. And, and with an understand, with an explanation to the masses, they get it. Now, the Uncle Tom, who you're talking to, you know, <laughs> they got their own reasons for not wanting to get it. They got their own reasons. They got an interest in not getting it. But you talk to ordinary folk who are out there in the community and run it past them, they get it right away. And they can be put in motion to reclaim everything that's been stolen from us. Just think about this. If I'm going to snatch a damn purse anyway, or rob a service station any damn way, just how much enthusiasm and, and genius I will put into the process if I know that I'm taking back what belongs to me in the first place. Just think, I would tell my neighbors, I would get my friends to involve in this, uh, that's what flash mobbing in part is all about. Hey, let's go get our stuff. So in the real world, it's happening. What we have to do is give it the understanding to masses of people who already have an instinct to take back the stuff anyway. So it's just some people who have an interest in not understanding this. I, I, like, you know, I'm so, you know, I, you, I know they didn't just say that. They said this to you. They said, I understand it, didn't they? They say, I understand it. But it's just some ordinary other people, they just can't get where you are coming from. That's not what they always say. And of course, it's nonsense, you know, because <laughs> the people can understand this very clearly. They just have an interest in not making it happen. Uhuru. So we get out there with the burning spear. We organize this army of the African working class just waiting. Sometimes they're not waiting. They're doing stuff on their own, but it's uninformed. They're rising up in places like all over England. They're rising up in places all over Europe with the struggle around the questions of Congo. They, they resisting in a thousand different ways, the way they wear their hats, the way they sag their pants. Now everything's saying, I don't care if the white man said do it this way, damn it, I'm gonna do it this way. They won't do what they're supposed to do in school. They, you know, they just reject and they're in a state of a certain kind of instinctive resistance. What we have to do is take the science of revolution, help them to understand why you're resisting and what the best way to use uh, to make this resistance happen. Our people want revolution. They are tired of them Uncle Toms, you know, uh, what does come to meetings and, and uh, try to find another, uh, 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 what do you call it, position from which uh, to lay uh, a lip lock on a, an exposed uh, area of white posteriors. They're tired of that, you know, of uh, having those kinds of discussions. Uh, and they want revolution. They want transformation. Uh, and, and the moment we can take it to them and the confidence that we can win, it's going to be easy to do. And more and more people are coming to the conclusion that we can win because they see everything that's happening around the world. I've, I've used this analogy before. And I'm going to let this brother speak in a minute. But I remember uh, when when Muhammad Ali had to fight with George Foreman. And uh, everybody was scared of Foreman. I mean, Foreman was knocking people out left and right. Uh, and, you know, people actually said when Ali fought him that this man's gonna kill Ali. I mean, literally, they were saying that this guy's terrible. And then when Ali knocked this guy out in the eighth round, everybody wanted to fight Foreman after that, <laughs> everybody wanted to fight him. I mean, people were lining up saying, I want to fight this guy, right? And that's the way it is out there. 
When we, you know, make our mark and strike out with our swagger and our red, black, and green, you know, uh, et cetera, especially the red, black, and green with that red star on it, uh, when we kick out uh, and people see this guy losing anyway all over the world, everybody want a piece of his ass. And what Africans are saying was, save some for me. <laughs> Increasingly, that's, that's going to be the articulation. I'm saying this, and I don't want this to give a false impression. Because we're talking about dying but not yet dead imperialism. I'm not saying that this guy's going to roll over and play dead. Uh, it's in a desperate situation. It's using, you know, drones to kill people in various places. Got them on the borders in this country right now, and they're going to use them in, this, in our communities. I'm telling you, you will see drones being used in our communities against our force. And there's going to be a lot of damage done before we win. But we're going to win. And the evidence is there for anybody who wants to see it. Uh, we're going to win. We're going to take this guy out because he has no place to go anymore. There, there's, and Krumah was right when he said neo-colonialism is the last stage of imperialism. After Obama, what they going to do? You know? And, uh, and they are frantic and they are frightened. And of course, somebody who's, who's armed and scared, you know, is dangerous. Right? Uh, but we are, we are calm. And we, you know, we are, you know, we have a cold analysis of our reality, and we have a vision of a future that cannot be denied. So uh, we're going to take him out. There's no doubt in my mind about this. I have, I, I live and participate in the revolution of the '60s. I've seen movements of thousands of African people. You, you pass out a flyer, and everybody in town comes to the meeting. Right now, you pass out flyers all day and hope six people show up. Right. Increasingly, that is going to change. I have seen it. And I would tell you this, that even comparing what we are now and where we are heading, that I am more optimistic today than I, than I was in the 1960s. In the 1960s, we had a saying, I had a saying, that if you live to be 30 in America and you're black, you are lucky. And if you live to be 40, you're Uncle Tom. Right? Uh, the, the assumption was in our communities that the revolution was right around the corner. We could smell it. We can taste it. And I'm saying that right now, I'm more optimistic now, now, right now, than I was then when all of that had broken loose because it's on the horizon. I can see it. I'm like Martin Luther King, been to the mountaintop. <laughs> but unlike King, I don't plan to do a Samson act. I'm, only, I'm getting there. I'm not only not getting there with you, I'm going to be leading the charge. <laughs> Uhura, yes, this brother, and then we'll shut it down. Uhura, my Africa. No, they shouldn't dictate our struggle. I think that at the moment we become clear what our own objectives are, then we can work with anybody. And uh, what our objectives are is what establishes the terms for the relationship. I can, walk, I can work with the occupiers and have been and spoken at Occupy Oakland meetings. No problem with that, because I know what our objectives are. And that sets the terms of what the relationship is that we're going to have with them. So, our position is, as African internationalists, uh, we're not race nationalists, and, but we're clear of where it is that we're trying to go. And any train that can get us to where we're trying to go, we'll ride it. Now, the train might not be going all the way, and if we know that at junction so-and-so, it's going to turn off, get off at that point. You know, we, we just have to be clear on where it is that we are going, and we can have a relationship with any force out there in the world, including the Occupy movement. And like I said, I believe 
I, I like to see the occupation movement. I just, this politic, it's, it's a white rights movement, but I like to see them uh, uh, to the extent that they really challenge uh, the imperialist state. I like that. I like to see them challenging. I like to see the state upset. I like to see them, you know, uh, 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 deepen contradictions of various kinds inside this country, even as we, knowing where it is that we want to go, uh, building our revolutionary capacity and taking advantages of that and even See, what they will do, if you don't know where you're going, somebody can come in to you, and then they can say, uh, uh, let's go this place. You don't even have a damn agenda. You don't know where the hell you're going. You know, and you get on the damn train with them, and you end up in a damn concentration camp. Don't know how the hell you got there. But if you know where you're going, you're the one who said, get on the train. You understand? You're the one who established what kind of relationship that you want to have with somebody. Our problem has been not that we work with the Tea Party, I mean the, the, the what do you call it, the, the left wing, <laughs> the, the occupation movement. Our problem is that we have done it without the benefit of our own analysis and our own goals and objectives in terms of what's going to forward our struggle. That's been the problem. Uhuru, I understand that somebody... Our party is the first Who is that? This is Parliament. Okay, from where? From uh, England, uh, ABSB UK. This is our party is the first political organization I ever met that was so open about leading struggle or even the question of leadership in general. It still appears to be a concept that troubles some people because they are caught up in the political liberalism, yeah. which obscures the whole question of leadership yeah. and the concept of dictatorship. Yeah. Can you say something <laughs> about why it is so necessary to be open about leadership, especially with regards to party organizations? Thank you so much for that, because what people are doing is they, uh, uh, they attack the concept of leadership. You know, even you talk about that, go to the occupation meetings, and there is no leader. Ain't no leader, right? Which is BS. There's no, there's BS. It's, it's, uh, 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 there is no leader. And it's the petty bourgeoisie that opposes the concept of leader while leading. You know, while leading, they oppose the concept of leader because if, they, if, if, if there's no concept of leading, then you can't lead. That's what it really means, you can't lead. It means we can't intervene and we can't lead. And, and, and so the question of leadership is fundamental. Uh, in fact, uh, the, when we look at the social systems that we are dealing with, the ability for these social systems to be effective is because there are advanced detachments of the ruling class who organize themselves in the forms of political parties and other things like that. It's not like white people have all these ideas, okay, let's take this position, let's take that position. They get those positions from some place. They get them from the advanced detachment that put them in movies and put them on TV. The newscasters were nothing but CIA uh, uh, agents, you know, uh, 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 who should be you know, uh, dealing with those, doing pole dances or uh, something else as opposed to, you know, broadcasting uh, on the news. Uh, you know, you have all these, the, these forces out there. They are the advanced detachment, the Democratic Party, the advanced detachment, uh, the Tea Party, all these kind of entities. They are the ones who give information and the newspapers to white people about what their views should be on any different, the movies. This is what informs them. So it's our responsibility to build organization. And there's the advanced detachment that represents the interests of the African working class in the liberation of our nation. We have to lead. And uh, unwillingness to lead is uh, a statement of maintaining us the status quo. And it's only the petty bourgeoisie that fears leadership, that does not want a leadership, uh, want leadership, but we're going to lead any damn way. And if they're in the way, you just have to lead over them. But that's a real, uh, a real uh, issue. And it's the petty bourgeoisie that's speaking, Kwabena. Kwabena, uh, they just don't want us to win this freedom. And they are for trying to protect the status quo uh, with that kind of silliness. Uhuru Africa. Yeah. He has been a great struggle uh, because uh, he didn't have us a lot like uh, in the UK. Uh, usually, we usually speak about the uh, African people visit, and we always speak about the African people visit in power. Yeah, you know, the government, and all that. but don't talk about the African people visit in Marxists. Uh -huh. You always say that this is the African people visit. The ASI struggle would begin to say that 
every single organization or individual who opposes the political genocide, and you always say it's probably before that. They are from the region of the county, all the way to the black people. They're from the region of the county, all the way to the county, stuff like that. But those folks are where they have to put people in the city. And the ASI helped us a lot. We begin to see, wow, this guy, that's, you know, he was presenting that to people in the city. And it was really uh, great. Now, you know, uh, whenever uh, the body speaks, basically the ASI is like uh, a video, uh, clear line. Uh, that uh, defense it, uh, the body from uh, anybody else who opposes uh, the African Revolution because our solution is one after one is and it needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to uh, come at Aisha. I'm going to end it. Um, I just want to make um, this comment in terms of African internationalism theory. Because the, the Marxists have been waiting for you know, socialist revolution, uh, transforming, transformative revolution happening in the industrial centers of the West, meaning you know, like white people leading this, uh, this revolution. And it's because of a really faulty uh, analysis, really messed up worldview, the inability to understand the question of, of, of the, the, the essential uh, feature of capitalism being parasitism. Uh, because that's been really helpful for us. That's why you know, we've said at different times where people are saying they didn't expect Egypt, we expected Egypt. And not only Egypt, there are other places because this is the whole thing rests upon this foundation. And the Marxists have not been able to see that imperialism and capitalism is under siege, not by white workers in the, in the factories of Germany, uh, but by, uh, by Muslims uh, in the masjids, <laughs> you know, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, by all these other kinds of forces around the world who don't necessarily represent, you know, like the ultimate uh, revolutionary aim, but they are part of the process of dismantling capitalism and imperialism itself. The ASI informs us of this. It doesn't give us, you know, so they've been looking for somebody who's quoting Lenin, and people like quoting Lenin, they're quoting the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> they're going, uh, uh, Allah Akbar, you know, uh, uh, they are, you know, uh, they, they coming from a whole different place that's blowing their minds and they can't catch up with it. But we could anticipate this kind of thing because the imperialist thing is unraveling and it has rested upon the, the, uh, the parasitic relationship it's had to all the peoples around the world. This is our time. And uh, the Marxists don't get it, they may never get it, you know, until they are in re-education centers someplace in Angola, you know, but, <laughs> but that's another story, Uhuru. So, uh, Comrade uh, Aisha, I know all of you have traveled long distances and you require an opportunity to pretend you're gonna get some rest and not spend on the rest of the night doing the things that <laughs> young people do <laughs> when they get together uh, under these circumstances and uh, but you won't have an explanation uh, for sleeping in the meetings tomorrow if you do that. <laughs> Uhuru.